Greetings, my name is Sean Williams. I am a professor at the Evergreen State College and I teach Irish studies and ethnomusicology, which is the study of music in context from anywhere in the world. About 40 years ago, I was very fortunate as a graduate student st to study with Joe Heaney, the great Shannos or old style singer from Connemara in Ireland. And so I worked with him for several years just prior to his death in 1984 and ended up um, using the lessons that I learned from him to um, study the Irish language, to learn songs in Irish. Um, and I traveled to Ireland many times and have worked with other Shanno singers since then. But Joe Heaney is the one who really started me off. And the reason I am talking about Joe Heaney today is because he spent his time in Seattle. And so this is a part of Irish Week in Seattle. So I want to um, sort of bring a sense of an Irishman who was one of the great representatives of both the um, singing tradition, but also the Irish language tradition that he brought to all of his lessons and all of his performances. So what I'm going to do now is share my screen um, so that you can, can see pictures of him and we can talk about him a bit. All right. Now, here we are. Joheny's singing of home. Uh, a lot of who he was when he was in Seattle was someone who actually sang very often of what it meant to be um, an Irishman, but in particular, an Ireland of the 19th century, not the 20th century, right? And, and in fact, I mean, the whole time he was in the States was in the 20th century. Um, but so much of what he learned was from the 19th century and people who had lived in the 19th century, that that was really um, what, he, what he wanted to bring to American audiences and then eventually to um, Seattle audiences. So let's look at his upbringing for a second. Um, uh, he was raised in Karna, which is a seaside uh, village, really, um, in the southern part of Connemara in the west of Ireland. And he was surrounded by singers his entire childhood, um, not just within his family, but within his community. And to this day, the region of Karna remains one of the um, strongest Irish language um, places and one of the strongest places for Shannos singing. And again, Shannos means old style. Those would be songs in Irish. Um, and usually they are love songs and laments. Okay, in English, we have a lot of ballads, um, and which are narratives, right, where you tell a story, first I did this, then I did that. Um, and in Irish, when you're singing in Shanno style, you're, you're really doing love songs that do not have a narrative function. Um, Joe Heaney achieved early acclaim for his voice, and he actually won the Eroctus, which is the All-Ireland Shanno Singing Competition in 1942. As you can see, he was born in 1919. So, um, you know, he was really moving up into the world of, of singing. So like many, many Irishmen, he moved to London to seek work in construction <clears throat> and thence to Scotland. And in both places, in England and in Scotland, he found a place for himself in the folk song clubs. Um, which were quite popular. Um, and this is the 40s and 50s and into the early 60s. He learned a lot of songs from other folk singers and um, started making his earliest recordings. Um, I believe his, uh, well, he, he did record some stuff in the 50s, but his, he has a 1963 album, um, the one you see on the screen. And um, he, he really started to come into his own as an immigrant and understanding what that meant, and in particular, what his songs meant for other immigrants. Um, he kind of was uh, instrumental in creating sort of a shared community. 
Once he moved to the United States in 1965 on the invitation of the Clancy Brothers, he began performing at folk festivals. And so I have a program here from the Philadelphia Folk Festival of 1973. He also performed at the Newport Folk Festival where Bob Dylan went electric. Uh, he's widely believed to have told Robert Zimmerman, Zimmerman to change his name to Bob Dylan because nobody would be able to say Zimmerman. Uh, I don't know whether that's true. And uh, we'd have to ask Bob, I guess. Um, in any case, he hooked up with the Seeger family and still was performing with the Clancy Brothers, um, you know, as, as their sort of representative of an older Ireland. Um, he got a lot of acclaim on stage. <clears throat> Then he moved to New York and he found work as a doorman at the Langham, which is one of the uh, really palatial residential hotels um, in New York City. And there's a whole string of them. And he would sing all day. He was well known to the, the uh, sort of upper crust residents of, of the Langham. Um, and so he, there's this one story that Basil Rathbone, the famous actor, um, had, uh, had lived there and he, um, succumbed to a heart attack and Joe Heaney was the one who cradled him as he was dying. Joe Heaney was also welcomed at the University of Pennsylvania at Wesleyan University at Dartmouth and at a number of other universities as a visiting artist. So he would come and teach the students there and do performances and, and that sort of thing. Um, those visiting artist residencies gave him his greatest joy and fulfillment. And so I just wanna point out that um, if you look at the map on the left, you'll see that um, Joe lived in Karna. I'm just gonna move my cursor here. Here's Karna in Southern Connemara, right? And so in a region with maybe 2000 people, um, and that's, you know, um, like the, the greater uh, Connemara region at that point in say, you know, the forties and fifties. He then moved to London where, um, it, you know, he, he became completely fluent in the transportation system and went through uh, the city with thousands and thousands of people, right? And then he moved to New York, right? And so here he is in the Upper East Side, um, right across the street from Central Park, um, where nowadays you might find a thousand people, you know, in a single block, right? Or 2000 people in a single block. And then ultimately moved to Seattle over here on the right. Um, he lived, uh, let's see, sort of in the Finney Ridge district for a while. And he had a multi-year residency at the University of Washington Ethnomusicology Division. And again, ethnomusicology is the study of music and cultural context. He held this visiting artist position where he, he instructed graduate students such as myself at the time, again, this is 40 years ago, uh, and it, he first visited there in 1978 and then was hired in 1982, where he worked until his death in 1984. Um, he, so he gave these private lessons. He led workshops with adult learners. Um, he frequently gave concerts. And this is where he received the professional acknowledgement as a singer, as a purveyor of um, his extraordinary art as a Shanmo singer um, that he had longed for his whole adult life, truly. Uh, so this photograph is at the University of Washington and um, you can see he's wearing a suit and tie, he's had his teeth fixed, um, and he is deeply, deeply proud of what he has accomplished, but not just proud for himself, he's really proud for Ireland finally, that Ireland is getting some acknowledgement um, as a home of, of one of the great arts of the world. Um, so in 1982, Joe Heaney received the National Heritage Fellowship, which is our American version 
of a living treasure status, right? And you can go to their website and, and see more information about it. But this, again, this is a, a really significant honor that meant a lot. Um, offstage in Seattle, he was hilarious. And, um, and so you can see this funny picture of him on the right, on the left, sorry. The one on the right is funny too, but the picture of him on the left is in front of his apartment building um, and he lived in a basement apartment and um, drank tea all day. And um, his, sometimes his students would come and visit him there. I visited him there. This place in the center is the Boulangerie, um, which was a, a French bakery. And um, he always called it Bouge Bouge and um, would stop in every day for some kind of treat. And of course he was beloved there um, because he was a, a joy to hang around with. And that doesn't mean that Joe Heaney wasn't a grumpy man in many ways he was, but not when he was at Bouge Bouge, right? Um, because of course they were giving him all kinds of wonderful um, almond croissants and, and that sort of thing. Um, this, this image to the right is Joe Heaney looking at a small bird on a table. This photograph was taken by Sandy Solstrom um, of Seattle. And, um, and so of course the bird is looking for crumbs and, and that sort of thing. But um, he was um, singing a, a song called Ainini, which is a, um, an Irish language song. It's a lullaby and, and you uh, basically treat your children as sweet little birds that you're trying to talk into sleeping. Um, he branched out, right, um, in the late seventies. He did a, a collaboration with John Cage and um, this is uh, John Cage's extraordinary piece called Roratorio, and it is based on um, Finnegan's Wake by James Joyce. And so John Cage, who is here highlighted in the center, um, basically created a musical happening in New York City that um, featured a number of um, important Irish musicians who you know, I'm sure you'll recognize if you're familiar with the, the instrumental scene in Ireland. Um, and um, so it's basically um, John Cage reading the sections of Finnegan's Wake while the instrumentalists are playing and while Joe Heaney is, is singing. Um, and there are a number of sort of freely recorded sounds from all over Dublin, um, all representing sort of the night dream of Finnegan's Wake. Um, and so you'll you'll hear, uh, gosh, the the sounds of uh, trucks and horns and people chatting in English and Irish and and that sort of thing. And and so this is very much a, um, at the height of Cage's avant-garde um, set of creations. And so people would walk through this performance, listening to Joe Heaney sing as as the character H C E. Here comes everybody. Um, and uh, and the musicians would play, and it, it was it was all um, overwhelming and exciting, basically. Uh, Joe Heaney had a lot of diverse audiences. It wasn't just people of Irish descent whom he um, whom he wanted to reach, right? And so, um, I, in this um, picture, Joe Heaney is talking with Mike Seeger, who uh, in 1978 who. Um, brought him basically to the University of Washington. And in this picture over here on the right, um, this is a reunion of some of um, Joe Heaney's students and people who knew him um, and some others, but his students were of um, all genders, all races and um, in all ages. And so he gave lectures to school children where he would tell them stories of the leprechaun and that kind of thing. And he also, um, gave lectures at retirement centers and um, to the adult learners as well as graduate students like me in my 20s. And, um, and so he really had a sort of a persona for everybody that was um, very much about the gold standard of Shano singing and of what Ireland is supposed to be, um, which is really an Ireland of the 19th century. Um, and so he always had to be right. So, for example, if I if I asked him about a song and said, you know, I I thought you sang it like this, he would say, absolutely not, you're wrong, and 
and that kind of thing. Uh, it was very important to, for him to be right. So as part of his persona, becoming the gold standard of Ireland and of Irish piano singing, um, the only way he could achieve this was by leaving Ireland. That if it weren't for Seattle and Seattle's um, celebration of him as a, as a, an, um, Irish language singer and um, as someone who was who held on very very powerfully to the old ways and the old days, um, Joe Heaney would not have been the Joe Heaney he was if he had stayed in Ireland. It was only by leaving Ireland that he was able to fully come into himself, um, and Seattle has so much to do with that. So. This, I ha for this slide, uh, you know, of course, I, I wanted to include this wonderful photograph of him, um, but he was performing home. He was performing Karna and Connemara and Ireland all as a, as a way of sort of weaving enchantment in his audience members. Um, so in a typical performance, he would introduce himself by saying, I was bred, born, and buttered. Um, you know, in, in the small village of Karna, in Connemara, in the west of Ireland. Um, and then he would give a sort of a history about Oliver Cromwell and, um, and you know, Ireland's centuries of oppression. And then he would start his first song in the English language, tell a story, and give a song in Irish. And he, um, of course, Irish was his first language. So he was very confident and um, you know, at, at great ease, speaking in Irish, singing in Irish, and he felt that it was extremely important that American audiences heard the Irish language, understood what he was singing, so he'd translate um, before he would sing it. And um, anyone who had any Irish at all he, um, among his students, he would just focus all of his attention on the Irish language songs. As it turned out, um, I, I was um, oh, a student of Irish um, as an undergraduate. So I had studied Irish for four years at the University of California, Berkeley. So he knew that I had some Irish and he just leaned on me to study the Irish language songs all the time. So for several years, I was given dozens of Irish language songs. Um, and, um, and it was very, very precise, very exacting. Um, that I should have the, the right Connemara accent in my singing and, um, and fully understand everything that I was doing. So he, when he would bring these uh, Irish language songs to his audiences, he, he would um, clarify the song, sing it, he'd stop in the middle and clarify a phrase, that sort of thing. He filled his concerts with jokes and anecdotes, little stories and that kind of thing. Um, and then he'd go back to English because he knew as a consummate performer that people's eyes would glaze over if he sang exclusively in Irish, um, tell a story, do a longer song in Irish, and then he would always lead the audience in a sing-along, uh, which was usually, I wish I had someone to love me. Um, and he may have gotten that one from Jean Ritchie, um, who traveled to um, London and Ireland um, with her husband. Um, he saw Ireland as a kind of collective homeland for everybody. And um, I recall him telling people who were not Irish Americans that Ireland was home. Um, and so in this image, you can see the sort of the powerful symbols of an Irish home. <laughs> the, um, you know, you can just imagine the turf fire inside. They're old people, everybody's speaking Irish, it's exclusively rural. And this is definitely an ideal from the 16th to the 19th century. Um, after Joe Heaney died in 1984, he was 63, um, he uh, became much more famous, much better known. Um, and there was a festival that was held every year in his honor on um, the bank holiday weekend in early May, which is, um, he died on, a, on May 1st in 1984. Um, and it's, you know, they, they do it most years. Um, and then an Irish language book was written about him here. Um, and it is a, a straight 
chronological biography. And I co-wrote this book, Bright Star of the West, with Lilis Onera, who is uh, himself a fine Shano singer. And he won the same Eructus competition that Joe Haney won in 1942. Um, Lilis Oliveira won it in, uh, twice in the 1990s. Um, there was then a recording made of his songs and stories, but actually, sorry, um, made of his songs, and, um, and then a later one done of his stories. Finally, most recently, um, there was a film, a film biography called Song of Granite. And it um, sort of it goes through his life and it, it does use footage of him. Um, and it also has other people um, acting as him. There's someone who um, is sort of a composite um, um, light haired female graduate student who may or may not have been me, um, but um, kind of me and everybody else who studied with him, right? Um, I want to thank you for your attention. I'm just going to stop sharing right now and um, explain that it has been um, so many years since I worked with Joe Heaney, 40 years since I worked with him. And I think of him every day and all of the, what, the, the authenticity that he brought with him to Ireland. Um, and the way he insisted on doing things the right way and um, was equally wonderful with school children and graduate students and people in their 40s and the elderly. Um, he had a story and a song and a good word for everybody. Um, and if he saw that you were taking him seriously, there's nothing he wouldn't do for you. Right, and it's um, because of him that I learned so much about Shannos and about the importance of uh, Irish authenticity in a world in which Danny Boy is sort of the favorite form of communication. And of course, there is a place for that as well. But Joe Heaney really wanted to offer something that was um, valuable and, yes, oppositional. Um, you know, in, in contrast to that. So um, thank you for your attention. Go to Amelia Maigot. Thank you all very much. Um, and again, I'm Sean Williams. I'm at Evergreen State College. Thank you.